And all of you are here in for a treat today. Uh, Sam Grala, who I'm very impressed with, uh, is going to tell us about one of the most amazing things that science has done in a long time, and that's the measurement of gravity waves. And he will describe it to us, and at the end of the evening, we'll have a, a, a quiz. And, uh... <laughs> but Sam is a theorist working on gravitational physics and relativistic astrophysics. He's interested in the strongest gravitational and electromagnetic fields in the universe, which occur near black holes and neutron stars. And you heard a little bit about this uh, last week. Sam applies techniques from diverse communities, relativity, astrophysics, particle physics, to study the physical processes occurring in these extreme environments. His PhD is from Chicago, and his postural work is from Maryland and Harvard. And we're really lucky to have Sam as one of our faculty members. Sam, where are you? Well, what a pleasure to be here in this beautiful hall, in this great university, in this wonderful city. I'm a newcomer to Tucson. I've been here less than two years. So I thought I'd start by telling you the story of how I came to the University of Arizona. When you're a young theoretical physicist, you apply widely, and you hope you get some interviews, which fortunately I did. Now, a job interview for a professor job is a little different from a normal job interview. It's really more like 20 or 30 interviews right after each other. You meet with everybody, professor after professor, half an hour meetings, you barely have time to pee. If you're lucky, in the midst of all this, you get to meet with the dean. Now, I had a thing I did with deans on job interviews. The first thing I would do when I got in the dean's office is I'd take out a book and I'd start reading it. That would get the conversation started, usually with something like, what are you doing? <laughs> then I'd say, you tell me one thing. If you're in a vehicle moving at the speed of light and you turn on your headlights, do they work? And Dean Joaquin Maurice at the U of A was the only one who did not immediately throw me out of the room. <laughs> okay, I made that one up. That's a recycled Stephen Wright joke. But the comedian Stephen Wright has his interviewee in his joke ask a really deep question. You go at the speed of light, you turn on your headlights, what happens? This is a good question for two reasons. First, it pushes us outside of our comfort zone, right? You think you kind of know how light works from living with light all around you, but as soon as you ask a question involving where you're moving like the speed of light, you get a little confused. Maybe you don't understand light so well because you're used to not moving that fast. The second reason Stephen Wright's question is a good one is because it's reasonably precise. It's not some vague, can you make light stop? It's some pretty precise sequence of actions you get in your car, you get it up to light speed, and you, you pull the lever that would normally turn the lights on. What happens? What happens? These kinds of questions that are reasonably precise yet push us outside our comfort zone are called thought experiments. And Einstein really was the pioneer of the thought experiment. He called them Gedanken experiments in German. This is not exactly the kind of thought experiment Einstein did, but it's close. And the answer to this particular conundrum was given to us by Einstein. The answer is you can't go that fast. <laughs> Seems a little unsatisfying, but wait. Einstein didn't mean your car won't go that fast. That's not what he meant. He meant you just can't go that fast. Nothing can go that fast. Not your car, not a truck, not a motorcycle, not a plane, not a spaceship, not an ambulance, not a backhoe. We have lots of those in my neighborhood right now. Not a garbage truck, not a fire truck. I have a two-year-old. He really likes trucks. He knows about suction excavators and so forth. 
None of your favorite desert animals can go that fast. Coyotes, road runners, you know those wolf spiders that seem like they're going the speed of light? Those ones can't go that fast. You can't hit a baseball that fast, a hockey puck. No excel elementary particle can be accelerated that fast. Absolutely nothing can go the speed of light. That's what Einstein taught us. There's a universal speed limit. Now, this speed limit is not, you know, Einstein's limit where he'll come give you a ticket if you violate it. This is a law of nature. You simply cannot go this fast, no matter how hard you try. That seems well and good. We have the authority of Einstein to back it up. But if you were a physicist around Einstein's time, you might say, hey, wait a minute, mister, that doesn't make any sense because of the following. I don't know about you guys, but I have memories from when I was a kid, riding in the back seat of my car, parents driving me on the freeway. You're watching the scenery go by, and then all of a sudden, whoosh, right? A car whizzes by you. Of course, they're just driving 60 miles an hour or so too, but they're going in the opposite direction. So to you, they're going 120 miles per hour. And there's a formula, V equals V1 plus V2, that if you wanted to, would tell you how to compute this. And it's really kind of indisputable, this formula, right? What is speed? It's how far you go in how much time. So if the car up here on the left is going 60 miles an hour, and in an hour then he'll be 60 miles to the right, and the other car will then in that same hour be 60 miles to the left. So in one hour, the relative distance is 120 miles, so they're going 120 miles an hour. Seems obvious. The person who is skeptical of Einstein now says, well, what if I'm going at 75% the speed of light? Now this obvious formula tells me that I measure the other car, whoosh, the one going by me, moving at 150% the speed of light, which is supposed to be impossible. So here's another thought experiment that seems to reveal something self-contradictory about this universal speed limit. We now have a situation that theoretical physics calls a paradox. We have two laws that we really believe, but they're incompatible. You can't have the universal speed limit and the formula V equals V1 plus V2. If you were a lesser physicist, you might think, OK, well, we know V is V1 plus V2. That's utterly trivial and obvious, so Einstein must be wrong. But if you're Einstein, you think, you know, we don't really have any good experimental evidence that V equals V1 plus V2 when you're moving near the speed of light. We've only done those experiments at 60 miles an hour, which might as well be standing still compared to light. So which of these do we keep and which do we discard? We keep the speed limit. It turns out that formula is wrong. Now. As Professor Dinas emphasized in the first lecture in this series, if you were here, physics doesn't discard laws. We don't establish laws and then find out they're false. Instead, we realize that certain laws may not apply as widely as we thought they did. In this case, V equals V1 plus V2 is perfectly true at 60 miles an hour, but it is not true near the speed of light. And Einstein derived the correct law. It's now up there on your right. You don't have to worry about the details in the law. The point is, it reduces to the old law when you're going slow, and it's compatible with the other law of nature. So we've resolved the paradox. So now, you're not going to measure 150% light speed. If you did the measurement, you would, in fact, get 96% light, light speed. If you actually got your Doppler radar, this is what you would measure the other car moving relative to you. So everything is happy with the idea that nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So what have we learned? Is it about cars? Well, it would also work for trucks. <laughs> Motorcycles, planes, spaceships, ambulances, backhoes, dump trucks, fire trucks, wheel trenchers, suction excavators. All of your favorite desert animals would observe this law. All of the, your favorite balls, if you played sports, would observe this law. Elementary particles. It's true for everything. When you think about it, it's not really about the stuff of the universe. This law doesn't care 
if you're a Gila monster, or a backhoe. This law is about something more fundamental. It's really about space and time itself. Now, why do I say that? Well, think about how I argued a minute ago that this original V equals V1 plus V2 law was so obvious. I said, well, the car up there is going to be 60 miles to, my, to your left after an hour, and the other car is going to be 60 miles to your right, so they're 120 miles apart in one hour, 120 miles an hour. That argument gives a wrong conclusion. The only slop in that argument are the concepts of space and time, the idea that if one goes 60 this way in an hour and the other goes 60 that way in an hour, that they're now exactly 120 apart in exactly one hour. That seems obvious to us, but that's not actually the way space and time work. Einstein taught us that you can't just add space and time together in the simple way that you think. The theme of our lecture series is rethinking reality, and this was a big one. This was 1905, special relativity. Einstein really rethought reality in a big way. Let me ask you another question. If I have a feather and a hammer, and I let them go, which hits the ground first? Well, in this room, the feather would float down, and the hammer would go wham, and hit the floor, maybe damage the stage. But if we did this experiment on the moon, where there's no air, there's just gravity, in fact, the feather and the hammer would fall at the same rate. Now, this is something that has actually been known about gravity since the time of Galileo, but the Apollo astronauts actually did this on the moon to dramatize it. There is actually a video of dropping a hammer and a feather on the moon. So this dramatizes something that's unfamiliar about gravity, but absolutely true, that gravity, like the other laws we have been talking about, acts on everything in the same way. Can you guess what I'm going to put up on the screen now? <laughs> that's right. I could drop a truck, a motorcycle, a plane, an ambulance, a backhoe, a Gila monster, a bark scorpion, and a wolf spider. They would hit the floor at the same time if there were no air. Gravity acts in the same way on everything. Now, here's Einstein's perhaps greatest insight in a life full of great insights. Gravity, since it acts the same way on everything, is also somehow not about the stuff it's acting on. It's more fundamental. It, too, is just about space and time. Einstein had this idea, and five minutes later it was still an idea, and ten minutes later it was still an idea, and it took him five or ten years, really, to flesh this idea out and turn it into equations. And the very first thing he had to do to flesh this idea out was to start listening to his mathematician friend, Hermann Minkowski, who had been harping on him, saying, no, 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 time and space aren't separate in your theory. In your theory, Einstein, you should think of time and space as space-time. They need to go together. So Einstein got on board with this idea that there should be space-time, three dimensions of space and one dimension of time, and that somehow gravity should just be space-time. And through much hard work, he hit on the idea that what gravity is is the curvature of space-time. Now, that's a kind of weird set of words. Why would he say that? Well, we all kind of know what curvature is for you know, objects in space. The surface of the Earth is curved. Or I could take a piece of paper and curve it in front of you. We'd all agree on what curvature meant. And there are mathematical equations that have been known for a long time that describe the curvature. What Einstein realized was that if he uses the same mathematical equations that describe curvature of two-dimensional sheets of paper to the four dimensions of space-time, he gets a theory of gravity. And the equation is up there on the top right. So this little cartoon up here you've seen in other lectures if you've been coming regularly. This flexible fabric you see looks two-dimensional on the board, on the screen. But it's just an uh, analogy. It's supposed to represent that the four dimensions, all three of space and time, are curved. And what makes the curvature is matter. 
So the big red blob in the middle might be the sun. The sun makes space-time curve. And then the Earth orbiting the sun, say, that white dot just follows the straightest possible trajectory in this curved space-time. And that makes it go around the sun, giving rise to gravity. So this was the hard part. Once Einstein had these equations, he had done the hard part, and then the real fun begins. And at some level, the fun hasn't stopped since he died. He, and many others after him, including me, are working out the amazing consequences of that equation on the top right. And the consequence I want to tell you about today is called gravitational waves. If you really buy into the analogy, it's actually almost trivial that there will be gravitational waves. Because if I wiggled that big red mass in the middle there, clearly the fabric is going to wiggle. Waves are going to go out. Waves in gravity. And indeed, Einstein got that equation in 1915. And in 1916, one year later, he had gravitational waves. Another good analogy for gravitational waves is waves on a pond. I don't know about all of you, but I don't float very well. So if I go out in a pond and try to float, I end up kind of thrashing all around. And I look a little bit like the gentleman in that picture. There's waves going out all around me. Now, if it was a really big pond, maybe a huge lake, and we're on shore, and we can't see the man thrashing around, we might still be able to learn that there was some thrashing going on because back at shore, we would see some waves. So you have to imagine a really still day where the pond doesn't have any waves on it at all. You're sitting on the shore, then all of a sudden you see some ripples come in. You might be able to learn from those ripples. You could put a bob in the water to measure the ripples. And you might be able to learn that there was thrashing around going out there. And if you're really good, you might be able to tell certain properties, like how big the man was, how hard he was thrashing, what frequency and so forth. That's really the basic idea of gravitational waves, except now, instead of a pond, we have space-time. So you have some thrashing around in space-time. Here we have a pair of distant black holes. More on that later. But they're thrashing around in space-time. And so gravitational waves go out. And back on Earth, you can try to measure these waves. Well, how do we do that? This is physics. We clearly need lasers. That's how you do it. You build two machines, one in Washington State, one in Louisiana, with big lasers. I'm going to explain that in a minute. But here's a movie just to get you oriented to the process. Two black holes orbit and merge. A burst of radiation goes off across the universe. Maybe it encounters some other civilizations on its journey, millions or billions of years. Finally, the gravitational radiation reaches us here on Earth. So we'll zoom into Earth, and you will see an absurdly exaggerated movie of what the waves do to Earth. They stretch and shrink it. They distort it tremendously in this absurdly exaggerated video. Here's the burst. And then the waves are gone off on their journey across the rest of the universe. Now, those waves were made by black holes. But we don't need black holes to make waves. I'm going to make some waves right now. I am shaking my fist. And I am launching gravitational waves. I am launching gravitational waves to the back of the hall. I am launching them to the people in the front. Can you feel the power, the awesome power of the gravitational waves washing over you? I'm shaking harder. I've doubled the strength of the waves. I am now changing the frequency. The waves are now in resonance with the human gut. Soon you will feel very nauseous, and it will get very messy. Is anyone feeling, feeling nauseous? Yeah. So it is true that moving matter makes waves. Any motion of matter disturbs space-time, sends waves out. And it is true that the gravitational waves stretch and compress and stretch and compress. This is among the many things that Einstein calculated. This is what the waves actually do to you. First you feel a little tall, then you feel a little wide, then you feel a little tall and wide. 
And you were all, in fact, getting stretched and compressed by the awesome power of my gravitational waves, but you didn't feel it. So why is that? Well, for the answer, we're going to turn to Einstein himself, 1916, who gave us this formula. You don't have to worry about the details, but let me explain what the symbols mean. H on the left is the strain. The strain is the same thing an engineer would talk about, the strain on a bar. It's a measure of how much stretching or compressing force. Here, we're quoting the amount of fractional stretching or compressing if the bar didn't have any internal resistance to stretching, if it were really just a free-floating blob of particles, and the gravitational wave washed by, if this h on the left was a tenth, then that free-floating blob of particles would stretch and compress by one-tenth of its length. So that's what h, the strain, is on the left. And on the right, with this i double dot and this d, you have some measure of how hard I'm shaking my fist and how far away you are from my shaking fist. But the elephant in the room here is the number on this slide, 10 to the minus 44. 10 to the minus 44 is a number so small, I don't think it comes up even in physics. I have never heard of a number this small. This number is as if you took an atomic nucleus and you lined up atomic nuclei all the way across the visible universe. That would take about 10 to the 44 atomic nuclei. That number, that fractional stretching and compressing, is as if the whole universe changed by an atomic nucleus. That is not a lot of stretching and compressing. And so when Einstein saw this, he surely thought, well, that was a nice theoretical point I made, but we are never going to see these. This is far too small. This is just theoretical physics, never experimental physics. Everything changed when neutron stars and black holes were discovered in the 60s and 70s. If you came last week to hear Professor Ozell, you learned a lot about neutron stars and black holes. They're unimaginably dense objects. A neutron star has the mass of the sun in the size of Manhattan. That makes the density of a neutron star the same as an atomic nucleus. It's like an atomic nucleus the size of Manhattan. It's a totally bizarre object. But if you took two such atomic nuclei the size of Manhattan, and you had them orbit each other at 100 or 1,000 times a second, which they can do, that's a pretty hard fist shake, right? That might make some gravitational waves. That can turn that 10 to the minus 44 into a whopping 10 to the minus 21. 10 to the minus 21 is also an extremely small number. And if you're me, you give up. But if you are one of the ingenious experimenters and theorists who thought up the experiments I'm going to tell you about next, you say, wait a minute. 10 to the minus 21, if I build a kilometer scale device, that's distance changes of less than a proton radius, but I think I might be able to do that. And Ray Weiss at MIT drew this sketch on the bottom left in an internal MIT journal. And together with Ron Drever, Kip Thorne, and many, many other important players, they put together the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO. Now, it's a little glib to do this in one slide and say 40 years, a billion dollars, and a thousand scientists. So I want to take some time to really emphasize how amazing this project is. As I'm going to describe in the rest of my lecture, this experiment has made a real breakthrough, the likes of which comes along, in my opinion, once every hundred years at most. This is a real breakthrough. And this experiment really was 40 years in the making. And the National Science Foundation and research universities in the US provided all the seed funding for the initial prototypes, the NSF picked it up and funded it starting in 1994. And over 20 years, they kept it going over changes of Congress, changes of administration, changes of NSF program director. Everybody had the vision to see this risky but high reward project through. And we should be proud as American taxpayers that through our elected and appointed representatives, we supported this project. So what is LIGO? There's two LIGOs. There's one in Washington State. There's one in Louisiana. 
And you can kind of make out that there's a lot of tubes. In those tubes are lasers. It's the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Let me tell you why. This device is called a Michelson Interferometer. This is something that here at the U of A, we teach our undergraduate physics majors in the second year of their study. So it's not something I can fully explain in the next three minutes, but I can give you the gist. The basic idea is you shine laser light out, you split it up, and then it bounces off mirrors and gets recombined. And then as a wave wiggles those mirrors, the amount of light read out changes. The reason you can do this is because light is a wave. Light has peaks and troughs. And when two beams of light meet, if those peaks and troughs line up, then you get more light. It's brighter. But if those peaks and troughs anti-align, as shown here on the right of your screen, you get no light at all. So whether the peaks and troughs are aligned or not is a very sensitive function of the distance the light has traveled in this setup. And so as the wave comes through and wiggles those mirrors, the peaks and troughs change their alignment, and the light read out on the right of your screen changes in time. That is the light that LIGO actually measures in order to measure the changes in distance of the mirrors as that gravitational wave washes through. Here's LIGO in a kind of CAD drawing. It's the same concept, but with lots of bells and whistles. These tubes are in vacuum. It's a very large vacuum. And there's all kinds of tricks they play to increase the power in the interferometer and to isolate it from sources of noise. That's really the hardest part of this whole business. You're trying to measure distance changes of less than a proton diameter. How do you do that when a truck could drive by and wiggle your mirrors by way more than a proton diameter or an earthquake could happen? What do you do? You need to be isolated from environmental noise somehow. And the way they do it is as follows. They have this amazing gizmo, this four-stage pendulum, which you see the design for on the left and some photos on the right. And this provides two kinds of isolation. There's active and passive. Passive isolation is like the shock absorbers in your car. When you drive over a bump, the bump hits your car pretty hard, but you don't feel much of that bump because there's springs in your car that damp that out and give you a smooth ride. They use that kind of passive noise isolation. And they also use active isolation, which is like your noise-canceling headphones. When you put them on and turn on the power, they actively cancel out incoming sound waves. Similarly, they actively drive this system to cancel out any incoming vibrations in the ground that it's attached to. Now, this talk has a lot of eye candy, a lot of really nice pictures, movies. But I have to tell you, this is the slide that still gives me goosebumps. I remember vividly, almost a year ago exactly, when this slide was released in a press conference at the National Science Foundation, which I streamed here at the U of A for students and faculty and anyone who was interested. And when I saw that signal, I thought, oh my gosh, that's a gravitational wave. Now, for you, it may not jump out to be a gravitational wave so obviously, but let me explain to you why. But before I do that, the most important thing about this plot are those numbers on the top left, GW150914. That is 2015, September 14th, my birthday. The gravitational waves arrived on my birthday. <laughs> Thank you, universe, for that birthday present. OK, that's only the most important of that, a part of that slide to me. To the rest of you, let me take you through it. First, look at the vertical axis. It says strain. That's that fractional stretching and compressing. And it says 10 to the minus 21. This is from the scientific paper. They did it. They measured those wiggles that you see in red are changes in distance of a part in 10 to the minus 21, less than a proton diameter. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, is time. Notice all this happened over just a fraction of a second. And now let's look at the red signal. The red signal is what the device in Washington state measured. That's the readout, which represents the changes in distance of the two mirrors. 
Is that a gravitational wave? Is it a truck driving by? Is it an earthquake? How do we know? Well, on the second slide, you see that same data on the right over plotted with the data from the other observatory in Louisiana, all the way across the US, and they line up perfectly. There's no way that the same truck drove in front of Hanford and drove in front of Louisiana at exactly whatever it is, three milliseconds apart, the time for the gravitational wave to come from one to the other in exactly the same way. They did a bunch of fancy statistical analysis to put some numbers to say that, yes, that's not what happened, and yes, that's really a gravitational wave. But this is why I knew right away when they put it up on screen that this was a gravitational wave. This signal was so loud that you didn't have to do any of that fancy statistical stuff. It just says, wow, gravitational waves from outer space. When we physicists try to understand these signals, we often convert them to sound. It's a quick way to get all the information about amplitude and frequency. So now I'm going to play the sound for you. And you're going to hear a bit of a thump. That's what it sounds like if you just take the frequency of the wave and convert it to a sound wave at the same frequency. You're going to hear that thump twice, and then you're going to hear the same sound, but upshifted into a frequency range where your ear is more sensitive to the features. You can hear it again. So that little whoop. We have a name for that. We call it a chirp. <laughs> that chirp's going to come back in about 10 minutes, so let's remember that name. Let me play it for you again in case you missed it. Again, the first thing you hear is a kind of thump. That's the actual signal, and you're going to hear that twice. Then you're going to hear an upshifted version. Then you're going to hear the whole thing again. Those are the waves from a binary black hole, that two black holes that merged 1.3 billion years ago, 1.3 billion light years away. The waves came all the way across the universe. They came to the LIGO experiment, and they made that sound. How do we know these are actually merging black holes, like I said? Well, again, they did a lot of fancy statistical analysis, but for this signal, it was so loud they really didn't have to. Again, this is a snapshot from the scientific paper. On the top line, you see the same two plots that I showed you before, the data from one interferometer on the left and the two stacked on top of each other on the right. On the second line, you see a theoretical prediction, a calculation from Einstein's equations of what the waves look like if two black holes merge. And then what do you do? You subtract the two. You subtract the prediction from the model, and what's left should just be noise, and that's on the bottom. So you see right away that, what is this? It's the normal noise in the interferometer plus a signal, which is merging black holes. Now, the way these theoretical calculations are done is by a supercomputer. We take the equations that Einstein wrote down in 1915, and we solve them on the state-of-the-art supercomputers. Here's a simulation of the orbiting and merging black holes of the same size and distance from each other that was measured by the LIGO experiment. Now, you see the black blobs and the tracers. That's just to orient your eye as to what's going on. All the interesting information is in the arrows and the colors and the shape of the sheet below them. That's representing the curvature of space-time. You'll see now the simulation will slow way down near merger, so you can see just how distorted space-time is getting. It's like a storm in space-time as the black holes finally merge, and there's really some cuspy, sharp features. There's a burst of radiation, and then the waves are off on their journey across the universe to LIGO. Here's another fun video. This is the question, suppose we were actually near these black holes and we were watching them in a spaceship. What would you see? Well, mostly you see the stars behind you. And you don't see any stars from where the black hole is because all the light has been swallowed up by the black hole. But you also see a very distorted pattern of stars. 
because the black holes bend light. So the stars don't look like their actual positions, they look very distorted. And I think we'll just watch the end of this beautiful movie together. Let me tell you what they actually measured for this system. It's not about just detecting gravitational waves. It's also about doing astrophysics, finding out what's out there. So how heavy were these black holes? How big were they? The larger black hole was 36 solar masses, meaning it had the mass of 36 suns. So I've drawn 36 dots to represent that. This was reported in the scientific paper. The other black hole was slightly smaller. It had the mass of 29 suns. And then they also measured the mass of the final merged black hole, which was 62 suns. So everything hangs together. If you take 36 and you add 29, you get 62. It's simple arithmetic. <laughs> wow, you guys are good at arithmetic. Yeah, 36 plus 29 is not 62. It's 65. What happened to those three suns of mass? Where did they go? Believe it or not, all of those three suns of mass, the weight of three suns was radiated away in pure energy carried by those gravitational waves. This is E equals mc squared energy, Einstein's other equation, right? Except if you think about the normal way we use E equals mc squared energy, you know, something really impressive like atomic weaponry, right? Atomic weaponry releases some tiny fraction of the E equals mc squared energy inside your, you know, warhead, which is not the mass of the sun. Here, you're releasing all of the E equals mc squared energy of three suns. That is a ton of energy, and you're releasing that in just a fraction of a second. And in fact, during that fraction of a second when these black holes merge, they're releasing more energy per unit time, they're brighter than the whole rest of the universe combined. As theorists, we knew this. Einstein's equations are well established. We know how to solve them on computers. We can calculate that when you merge a 36 and a 29 solar mass black hole, you radiate away three solar masses of energy. And we talked about this, but now we've actually observed it happen in nature. It's fantastic. Another really fun part of LIGO's story is this amazing signal I've been telling you about, which arrived on my birthday, September 14, we almost missed. The LIGO experiment decided to start their observing run on September 12th. And the founder of LIGO, Ray Weiss, was dragging his feet. He said, oh, it's not quite calibrated. We don't want to start. Let's get it perfect. But the younger crowd convinced him to go for it, and we're glad he did, because two days after they turned it on, right? This thing's been in the works for 20, 40 years. Two days after they turned it on, they measured this spectacular signal. They saw something else in October, which is probably a signal. They're not sure yet and then another confirmed one in December. Then they took the experiment down, upgraded some of the optics, improved the seismic isolation, and they're observing again now. Already, just from one measurement, we learn a little astrophysics. First of all, we learn that black holes can find each other and merge. That's not obvious. Predictions for how many black holes there would be and how often they would merge were all over the map. Now we have tight constraints on that. And we really discover a new type of black hole because previously from X-ray studies there in the purple, we knew there were black holes of around 10, 15 solar masses. And from other studies like what Professor Ozell told you about last week, we knew there were giant black holes of a million solar masses. And now we know that there are also 40 and 60 solar mass black holes. So that's the weight of these black holes. What about the size? Well, to set the scale, I'll give you a map of the eastern United States. I think that's the part I'd like to blot out with black holes right about now. <laughs> There's the signal I've been telling you about. That's how big those black holes are. There's the candidate signal, and there's the smaller black holes that were also measured. So these are, you know, state-sized objects with the mass of 30, 40, 50, 60 suns. LIGO is just the beginning. We have two detectors, LIGO-Hanford and LIGO-Livingston. 
Those are the ones that made the detection, but there are many more detectors around the world, either operational, coming online, being built, or planned. And in five to 10 years, we should have all six of these detectors working in Germany, the GEO detector, Virgo in Italy, LIGO India in India, and Kagra in Japan. It's great to have more detectors because gravitational waves are a little bit like sound. You don't really know where a sound is coming from. If you have two ears, you can sort of tell where it's coming from, but not very precisely. If you have three ears or four ears, you could start to tell more precisely. And if you have six ears, you can really start to get a good handle on where that sound is coming from. So if we have six detectors, we can really tell where in the sky the gravitational wave is coming from. And we can tell our astronomer friends, hey, go point your telescopes over there. You might see something interesting. When we have these six detectors, and even before, we have a lot of fun ahead of us. We're super excited about the first signal we saw, merging black holes, but we're going to see a lot more. I'm sure LIGO has already seen more black holes, although they don't tell people who aren't officially in the collaboration, uh, but I've heard rumors. There are supernova explosions when stars end their lives and explode. They make these giant explosions. That probably makes some gravitational waves. We'll hope to observe those. My personal favorite is merging neutron stars. Again, a neutron star is matter at the density of an atomic nucleus. We don't know very much about matter at the density of an atomic nucleus. So we're going to learn a lot of nuclear physics if we can start seeing a lot of merging neutron stars, because those waves carry information about the process of merging. We'll see rotating neutron stars, and perhaps most excitingly is the question, question, question mark on the right. Because we've really opened a completely new window on the universe here with gravitational waves. And every other time in the history of astronomy that we've got a new way of looking at the universe, like when radio astronomy started or X-ray astronomy started, every time there were expectations and there were huge unexpected discoveries. So perhaps most exciting are the things we don't know about that we will discover with this new way of seeing the universe. Let me change gears a little bit and tell you about my own research. I work a lot on gravitational waves, and one question we asked recently was, what if a black hole spins really fast? You can spin a black hole, and you can spin it really fast. You can't spin it at the speed of light. Nothing can go faster than light, but you can get it really, really, really close, at least in principle. So here's a sound of a waveform that is from a normal black hole. This is theoretically generated. We just made this on our computers as part of the research. But this is just a comparison signal for what a normal black hole merger sounds like. Right at the end there, there's that nip. That's the chirp. CHIRP is the hallmark, the calling card of merging black holes. All the theoretical predictions had always predicted CHIRPs, and that's what LIGO measured. But when we got one of these black holes spinning really fast, when we finally cracked the mathematics to let us explore this regime, something very interesting happened. It starts the same, but you're not going to hear a CHIRP from this rapidly spinning black hole. just sits on a single note, and it fades away. We called that a song. <laughs> it's very different. It's not nip, it's <laughs> So why is this exciting? Well, in astrophysics, we don't have great ways of measuring how fast these black holes spin. But now, we can tell that if you hear a sound that doesn't chirp, it just sings, you're looking at a black hole spinning really, really, really fast. Now, we gave this black hole a nickname. And our scientific paper has a funny title up there on the right, In Spiral Into Gargantua. If you've seen the movie Interstellar, there's a black hole called Gargantua. And it turns out, for the plot of Interstellar to make any sense at all, 
that black hole gargantua has to spin very rapidly. It has to spin with 99.9999999999% the speed of light. 14 nines. So, is gargantua out there? How would we know? Well, if the next thing LIGO hears, or some other experiment in the future, if the next thing they hear is this song, then we've discovered gargantua. When I started thinking about this problem, I wasn't thinking about astrophysics at all. Rapidly spinning black holes turn out to be a really good theoretical testing ground for the following sort of pure theoretical physics question that I'd like to describe for you. It's called the black hole information paradox. At the start of the talk, I gave you a paradox involving the speed of light being the upper limit that you can physically go, and this formula, V is V1 plus V2. That paradox was resolved 100 years ago. This paradox is still with us today, and it's really driving theoretical physics, I'd say, more than any other paradox. In its simplest form, the question is, can you tell what was thrown into a black hole? So these are thought experiments, not real experiments, but we used to do them with cats. We would throw the cat into the black hole, <laughs> and then we started feeling bad about that, so now we use graduate students. That seems to go over a little better. But in these thought experiments, not real experiments, we either throw a cat in or a graduate student in, and then we ask you to come back later and look at the black hole, and can you tell, in principle, not in practice, if it was a cat or a graduate student that I threw in? Einstein's theories say no. The black hole, anything that goes into it, is for all intents and purposes gone from the universe. You will never be able to tell in principle whether I threw in a cat or a graduate student. But there's another theory of physics that you'll hear about a lot more in two weeks with Professor Chu's lecture, which is quantum mechanics. And all the formulations of quantum mechanics that we know about have a fundamental law that information is preserved. In quantum mechanics, you have to be able to tell, in principle, if not in practice, whether it was a cat or a graduate student. So there's a fundamental tension here. And it's really Stephen Hawking who first pointed this out after discovering some fantastic properties of black holes that made it very apparent. His paradox is really still with us today. Now, I did not solve this paradox, alas, when I was thinking about rapidly spinning black holes, but it led to a new prediction in astrophysics, which just shows the interconnectedness of science. In the last few minutes, I want to take a step back and think about where in the history of science and astronomy this gravitational wave discovery lies. You may know that light is just one wavelength of electromagnetic radiation and radio and microwave and infrared and ultraviolet and x-ray and gamma ray are other wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. There's a whole electromagnetic spectrum. Astronomy really began when Galileo first turned his telescope to the heavens and among other things discovered the moons of Jupiter. You can see his sketches there. There's Jupiter with four little moons that he observed. Since that time, we now have astronomy in all of these different wavelengths. In radio astronomy, we've discovered incredible things. We, that was the discovery of neutron stars, in fact. Up there in the top left, that speck there is a whole galaxy. That galaxy is shooting out particles moving near the speed of light in a straight line for hundreds of times the galaxy size until they make this beautiful plume that we see in the radio. Some of my other research is aimed at trying to understand what the heck is going on there. In the microwave, we can see light left over from after the Big Bang, 13 billion years ago when the universe was just a hot plasma, no stars, no planets, just hot plasma, no elements even. In the infrared, we can see galaxies, learn about their structure, trace them through cosmic time. In the visible, well, we've come a long way since Galileo. Now, if we look at Jupiter with our best instrument, the Hubble Space Telescope, we get that beautiful image. That's not a painting. That's a picture of Jupiter. In the ultraviolet, we can see the storms on the surface of the sun and learn about plasma physics at high temperature. These coronal mass ejections that wipe out communications here on Earth, we can study those, among other things. And in X-ray and gamma ray, we see the high energy events in the universe. 
The gamma ray sky looks like that big image on the upper right there, except every once in a while when there's a bright flash called a gamma ray burst. Those gamma ray bursts were actually first discovered by military satellites looking for Soviet nuclear tests, but they pretty quickly figured out that the gamma rays they were measuring were actually coming from outer space. The origin of those gamma rays is still pretty much a mystery, and it's a mystery LIGO might help unravel. But that's the electromagnetic wave spectrum. Gravitational waves also have a spectrum. And where are we in observing this spectrum? Well, we're just like when Galileo first pointed his telescope to the sky. We've made one observation. It's tremendously exciting, these merging black holes, but it's one observation at one tiny frequency band in this whole spectrum. As LIGO becomes more sensitive, we'll start to hear higher frequency things, maybe supernovae and merging neutron stars. There are space-based detectors in the works that will measure the monsters of the universe, supermassive black holes, black holes with millions or billions of times the mass of the sun. There are other detectors that get us to even lower frequencies where we might hear cosmic strings, or if we're very lucky, gravitational waves from the Big Bang itself. Let me summarize. I started the evening telling you about how a century ago, Einstein discovered a deep new reality of interconnected space, time, and gravity. He discovered new things about physics. Those consequences of Einstein's equations were revolutionary and they are still with us today. And a hundred years later, one of those consequences has now been turned into a tool. We are now using Einstein's gravitational waves to hear the universe in a completely new way. And in closing, I want to leave you with two questions. What will we learn in the next 100, 200 years with this new astronomy? And what will be the next revolution in space, time, and gravity? Thank you very much.